Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for the nice introduction. And thank you and the organizers for the nice invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak and an honor to speak in this, in this seminar. So today I uh, will talk to you about uh, exponential mixing for random flows, which is a joint work with uh, Alex Blumenthal from Georgia Tech and Risha Gablani from Max Planck Institute in uh, Leipzig. And it's uh, just a recent preprint on archive in which uh, we wanted to understand certain properties of uh, uh, fluid mixing, uh, uh, but where the velocity field essentially is given by uh, constructed in a random or stochastic way. So um, I'll just introduce the topic by talking about passive scalars. So passive scalars is a term to, to think of uh, a scalar quantity rho that is advected by a velocity field u and the rho is uh, can be thought physically as a concentration for example of pollutant in water and it's uh, simply steered in an assigned way uh, which uh, i will assume to be incompressible for the purpose of this talk and uh, it can be a time dependent and space dependent uh, uh, velocity field but uh, uh, divergence free and uh, I put myself in the simplest situation. So uh, the case of uh, uh, a, a d-dimensional periodic domain and I will soon restrict to 2D uh, when I I'll talk about examples. Uh, but uh, the idea is that I would like to understand what happens to the solution rho as time goes to infinity. And um, well, I mean, uh, we can try to think what happens in terms of uh, 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 mixing, which is the main concept uh, coming from, say, physics uh, that uh, we have in mind. Uh, but uh, what you should keep in mind is that uh, typically solutions like this uh, should uh, be conservative, um, at least uh, in strong norms, but they can be dissipative in a sense in, uh, in weak norms. So this is essentially what uh, I will uh, try to tell you about. And uh, in this talk, I will assume that the solution has uh, mean zero. So this can be assumed for the initial condition and it's something that is uh, uh, transported by the flow. So just to uh, see what uh, we're talking about here, let's take the simplest uh, um, divergence free field that we can think of, uh, something that's called the shear flow. So it's, uh, uh, it has parallel, uh, streamlines and they are horizontal uh, in, uh, in this case. And uh, the velocity field is given by a scalar function of the second variable in the first coordinate and zero in the second coordinate. So this is the simplest uh, uh, flow that you can think of. And take a u of y equals sine of y, for example, in T2. And here is the picture of what you see. So you start with an initial condition that has zero mean, say minus one here and plus one here. I think the condition here is exactly sine of x, in fact. And uh, you see that, uh, well, under the effect of uh, a function, the function sine of y, you see exactly this, uh, uh, this function appearing while uh, simulating this equation. And what you notice is that in the x direction, nothing really happens in the sense that the x average is concerned. So if I draw a horizontal line here, you see that I always see uh, zero average in, in this case, because I started with zero average. My initial datum is sine of x, which has zero x average. But if you draw vertical lines, I see smaller and smaller scales appearing. So you start from a scale that is order one, let's say, and then, well, as time goes on, you see uh, smaller scales appear, okay? so. This phenomenon is, uh, should remind you of something uh, called averaging. So if I uh, look at the uh, horizontal, sorry, vertical lines, I see a smaller scale. So you can think that you have filamentation and sort of averaging in uh, uh, directions that are not horizontal, okay? So to put this in mathematical language, uh, we can think of taking the X average of the equation and of course, as I mentioned, this is conserved and you can see it's right away from the equation. The integral with respect to X goes through the function of Y. And so nothing happens to that point. So the X average is conserved. While what you should expect is that uh, uh, the um, solution minus the X average 
which you can take to be zero at the beginning, goes to zero. But goes to zero only weakly and not strongly, because uh, if you think about uh, averaging, this is usually associated to weak convergence rather than strong convergence. And in fact, we know that uh, the L2 norm of the solution is conserved. This is just transport equation. So the convergence to zero cannot happen uh, strongly, but uh, only uh, weak. Um, of course, this is a simple uh, picture of a shear flow, but uh, you can think of more complicated flows. This is a, a picture that I stole from the website of uh, Jacques Van Nest in Edinburgh. Um, I start with a concentration again, red is high and blue is low. And I steer it uh, uh, by random flow. So some realization of a, of a random flow. And uh, here you see there is not a conserved quantity like the X average before. You see small scales creating, and you would uh, conjecture that uh, everything goes uh, uh, to the average, let's say zero in this case. Um, as time goes on, in this, in, in this case, there has been uh, some diffusion as well in this, uh, in this problem. So the diffusion you can see from the picture as blurring of the, of the sharp gradients that you form, essentially. But uh, uh, for short time scales, the picture that you should see is exactly the one, uh, the inviscid picture. So the one that I talked about before, just the transport uh, equation. So you can think of that given that this random flow, all solutions uh, are mixed. So all solutions converge to their average. And uh, um, you may ask yourself uh, how to quantify mixing. So can you write down a quantity that tells me how mixed uh, is the solution rho at a given time? And uh, the second question is how fast is rho mixed? So can I give a rate uh, for this uh, uh, quantity? I just defined answering question two. So, um, so as I said, since mixing is a cascading process that uh, transfer information from to smaller and smaller spatial scales, you can think of these as uh, transferring information to higher and higher frequency. So if you think of taking a Fourier transform of the solution and call rho k its uh, Fourier coefficient, for every fixed k, it should be that uh, uh, rho k of t goes to zero because the information in that mode k will transfer to higher and higher frequencies. So this is equivalent to weak convergence to zero uh, in L2 of the solution because the L2 norm is uh, conserved. And this is equivalent indeed to uh, the convergence to zero in a strong sense of the H minus S norm. So mixing uh, in this paper by Lin, Tifol, and Doring, but in many other papers, this is the one that I like to cite the most, but there are many others uh, even previous to this, define mixing as the convergence to zero of the H minus one norm in this paper. H minus one is relevant in 2D because it's uh, dimensions, it's, it has dimensions of length. And so if you would like to consider an average length of the solution, uh, you want to be also dimensionally correct. And so H minus one in 2D would be the, the good one. But mathematically speaking, any uh, H minus S norm is okay. They are all equivalent to weak convergence to zero uh, of the solution. Um, so this is a point of view that would be great if you could just write down a, an H minus S balance for your, um, for your solution and prove some kind of uh, decay to zero of this uh, quantity. But uh, typically this is not the case. And so a different point of view, which is in the end equivalent, but uh, allows to use different tools maybe is that uh, by looking at the flow map of, uh, of the, velocity field. So the flow map is just the characteristics, right? So it just gives me uh, at time t the position of a particle that started uh, uh, at point x and is transported by the velocity field. So uh, if one uses this flow map, it turns out that uh, uh, the k of z to zero of the h minus s norm is essentially uh, similar at least uh, to the decay of correlations. So what am I doing here? I'm looking at, uh, I'm taking say test functions F and G in certain class, and I'm composing G with the inverse flow map X. So G of X inverse is exactly 
the solution of my PDE starting at the initial datum G. Okay? And I test against F and I assume that this goes to zero. So mixing can be defined as this quantity goes to zero and because I have a divergence free field, X is a measure preserving map. And so I can just move it to the other one and write it like this. Okay, so these two are the same and mixing can be defined as this quantity goes to zero for every F and G in a certain class. And if, for example, I can take uh, F and G in say HS and I can take the soup over them. So I have some sort of uniformity in terms of the norm, the HS norm of F and G, then uh, of course, this is exactly the same as uh, the H minus S norm, if you think about duality, okay? So uh, these two, the, the, in this sense, the decay of correlations, this is a notion used more in the dynamical system and the decay of H minus S norm is basically the same. It takes at least the same effort to prove. Uh, okay, so what can we say about uh, the um, decay of the H minus one norm in certain problems? So as I mentioned, if you take a shear flow, uh, you can prove that the decay of the H minus one norm is algebraic. So it's like T to the minus one over N. And N is something that depends only on the shear flow. And it depends in fact only on the order of the critical points of, uh, of the shear flow. So if you have uh, a say simple critical point like you do have in sine of Y, then uh, N is equal to two because the first derivative is zero to the critical point but the second derivative is not zero. So if locally your flow looks like y to the n, then you will get uh, t to the minus one over n, essentially. Um, in particular, the flatter the critical point, the slower the mix. Okay, this is the takeaway message. Um, you can do similar things for circular flows. So these are flows whose streamlines are uh, closed circles, say in the whole of R2. And this was done by Kripa and Luca and Schulze and uh, myself and Matthias Tepadina and Tarek Gindi. Uh, you can prove mixing grades for these, uh, for these guys as well. And by the way, all of these solutions are uh, stationary solution to Euler, so to the, to the Euler equation. So uh, you may want to try to understand the, the dynamics of a simple dye of color immersed in a fluid uh, before trying to understand the say stability of these solutions uh, with respect to the Euler equations as well. So, this is a good problem to think about uh, if you want to study also the stability in the 2D order equations. Um, what if you go uh, rougher? So instead of taking smooth shear flows or smooth circular flow, you take the C alpha shear flows. So typically, one thinks, or at least it's a belief in, in the applied literature, that uh, rough flows mix better. Okay. So, and this is indeed uh, sort of true in the sense that generically, the Latin Gubinelli proved that uh, T minus, uh, the a C alpha shear flow mixes like T to the minus one over alpha. So if you take a smaller and smaller alpha, then uh, T uh, to the minus one or alpha are the case faster and faster to zero. Uh, however, deterministically, it's, uh, at least we don't have an example of, uh, of such a flow. There is uh, something uh, related to uh, fraction of Brownian motion that uh, one can construct that achieves this rate. But deterministically, we show that in fact, uh, this is not always the case and there are exceptions. Um, and uh, we constructed one with Maria Colombo and Klaus Maria that uh, actually mixes only to one over T, but it is a C alpha function everywhere. So, it's some of one of these sort of bias stress type uh, functions. Sorry, here alpha is less than, than one. Excuse alpha? me? Alpha, alpha is, is between zero and one, yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I meant to hold your continuous uh, flips. Yeah. Um, now, if, you, if you're looking at regular autonomous velocity fields, so all the examples up to here are time independent. We know that we cannot mix faster than one over T. And this is a, a result by Paolo Bonicat and uh, Elio Marconi. Um, however, if you uh, go to time dependent flows, you can mix faster. So there are various papers listed here. So either you give me an initial datum and I give you a velocity field that mixes this datum, this datum exponentially fast 
And so these are the results of a dirty cryptomatic cut in the ions lattice. Or even you can actually construct a velocity field that mixes all mean free initial data or almost all mean free initial data, at least with some regularity assumptions. And the regularity of U is uh, this L infinity WSP for some SP that are not uh, so big. Okay. So um, these flows are, in my opinion, uh, great in the sense that they mix universally, but uh, they're not so smooth in a sense. And this is sort of the best result that we know uh, up to now, deterministically, unless there were recent developments I'm not aware of. Um, now, uh, I mean, with the deterministic construction, uh, let's say. And exponential is the best possible rate. So this was shown in, in, in a series of work. So in, in, if you are uh, at least, uh, you have some regularity of your velocity field, you cannot mix faster than exponential. Okay. So in a sense, these results achieve this mix lower bound uh, that, uh, that you had here. Uh, okay, so um, if, you, if your construction instead relies on some probability, uh, you can uh, do a uh, bit better in the sense that, uh, for example, the Drossen, Blumenthal, and Kunshu Smith prove that if U is coming from the stochastic Navier Stokes equations, then you will get exponential mixing. And uh, in particular, uh, the uh, solution to the stochastic Navier Stokes equation is uh, smooth in space, at least, and can be made uh, CK in time for every K. Okay. So, but it's not an infinity, uh, so it's not uniformly bad. But this is uh, an improvement in the regularity, and you know you take a realization of this uh, this velocity, and you get uh, an exponential mix. And if you go rougher, uh, you can also prove that uh, the scope Cragnan model, which is a model that is uh, 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 essentially uh, you built in the correlation function of uh, the velocity field and uh, in space and it's the correlative in time, then you do get uh, uh, exponential uh, mixing and these uh, more recent results by Flandre, Galati, and Lu and Gess and uh, Yaroslav. So uh, the question that remains open though is can you build an exponential mixer that is smooth in time and space and it's also uniformly bounded uh, in time? Um, so this is a question that I want to uh, address today. So, and the model is not that uh, we had to uh, come up with a new model. Uh, the candidate uh, has been known in the literature for a while and has been used in numerical simulations a lot, for example. And it's an example by Pierre Ambert, so in 94. So take uh, a velocity field that alternates every tau instance of times between a horizontal and a vertical shear flow. And uh, what you do is that besides alternating, you have to uh, change the phase of your shear flow. So think of sine of y and you take uh, a different phase all the time, okay? And um, so the random phases, I will collect them in a, a sequence or in a vector in, in this case, omega j1 uh, and omega j2. And what I do, I take uh, first horizontal shearing. So at time n, I put sine of x2 minus omega n1. This is my phase that I pick there. And then I alternate it after tau time to uh, sine of x1 minus omega 2n. Okay. And I do this for each n. So this is the velocity field at time step uh, uh, n. Okay. And uh, these. Uh, is observed to be an exponential mixer. And if you just uh, try to simulate it, uh, you realize quickly that it, it is definitely mixing. Okay, this is just my initial datum, one here minus one here. And I mix it with this uh, flow. Okay, so it definitely mixes. Uh, uh, this is just for the purpose of visualization. I never try to compute uh, how fast the H minus one uh, norm uh, uh, goes down. But we know it goes down exponentially. Uh, I spoil it to you. Um, but this has been used a lot in numerical simulations, and these type of flows can be rephrased as a dynamical system. So 
so the random dynamical systems in which my flow map alternates between sending the coordinate x1, x2, and sharing it horizontally in this way, and then I share it vertically in, a, in, a, in the opposite way. And so my dynamical system is just an iteration of maps that uh, first uh, horizontally shares uh, with phase omega 1, 1, and then vertically shares on omega 1, 2. And then I compose this map by at each time changing phases, okay? So this is the composition of uh, random maps that I am, uh, I'm doing here. And uh, by time rescaling of the actually continuous time problem, you can uh, prove that it is enough to look at the discrete dynamics. And this is a time rescaling that was uh, in the paper of the Allen's Latosham uh, exponential mixing. Um, so here my omega underline omega is uh, uh, the sequence of uh, random phases which lives in uh, each, each element is a two-dimensional uh, vector. Um, okay, so we can rephrase this as just a more general setting. So we'll talk about uh, the, say, sort of an abstract result about exponential mixing for this type of uh, discrete uh, uh, maps. And then we'll come back to uh, the verification that uh, the Perenberg model is in fact exponential mixing. So, what uh, we can think of is having the fixed probability space, omega zero of zero, uh, P zero, and a complete metric space X. And uh, I consider uh, the uh, random composition of maps where F of omega one is some map on X, uh, from X to X so that uh, depends somehow on uh, uh, some sample that uh, omega one that is sample from omega zero and I have uh, n copy of this. And uh, out of this, I can build transition kernels that tells me where, uh, what is the probability that my point starting at X ends up in uh, a um, set A, subset of the matrix space X, so a Borel subset. And uh, yes, I can, uh, I can iterate these and uh, look at uh, this uh, composition of uh, maps and look at uh, essentially at the Markov chain and try to understand the synthetic behavior of this, uh, this chain. So in the case of Pierre and Bear, right, I have X to be a compact uh, uh, manifold without boundary. So it's just a torus. And P0 is just uh, uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the back, or really the back measure in our case, and f of omega is measure for certain. So these are the basic assumptions I need for my abstract framework uh, uh, to work. Uh, so, and there are some important properties uh, of random dynamical systems that uh, you have to be aware of uh, in order to, to look at this. So, one is their irreducibility. So, um, it tells me that. Uh, uh, for every X and every open set U, uh, the probability that uh, uh, the solution will end up in U is uh, uh, non-zero, okay? So this tells me that there is no uh, subset of the phase space that is sort of uh, excluded from the dynamics, okay? Everything is sort of rich. Um, you would need some property like a periodicity, so you don't want to allow cyclic uh, uh, behavior. Um, usually, a key property is a so-called minorization property that tells me that the relatively small set of the phase space is uh, sort of uh, uh, connected uh, to all other sets of the phase space and the drift condition. So drift condition is uh, something like uh, a Lyapunov function that uh, controls the large deviation of my system, okay? so. These four properties are important because of the following theorem that is uh, uh, Harry's theorem. So if I have a, a transition kernel P that uh, uh, has the four properties that I listed before, then I know that there exists a unique invariant measure for, uh, or stationary measure for this uh, chain. And this measure attracts all observable exponentially fast. So this is what is the constant content here of this uh, theorem. So essentially, and I want what to study is strong, the strong periodicity. What is strong and periodicity? Not so strong. Well, uh, let's say for finite state, uh, uh, 
let's let's talk let, let's uh, keep it a periodicity i i had uh, maybe there is a typo here so um it's it's just cyclic behavior should be ruled out uh, so if uh, this is the case then i have uh exponential convergence to the uh stationary measure of every observable so if i look at the Marcos semigroup that acts on observable on continuous one functions, say or measurable functions, in this case L infinity functions on X, then I do have convergence to uh, their average exponentially fast. So gamma is a number between zero and one. And uh, the uniformity is given with respect to the Lyapunov functional that I mentioned before, uh, which is uh, the fact that F, F, sorry, phi, the test function is bounded. Uh, in a weighted space, weighted by the um, the Lyapunov functional, and uh, um, the convergence is also non-uniform in, in the sense that uh, there is uh, this Lyapunov functional that appears on the right hand side. However, if you are in a compact uh, manifold, so for example, for my characteristics uh, uh, x uh, capital X, or my my composition of functions uh, uh, for the pierre bear model, well. The four condition is not needed and is automatically satisfied, in fact. And so uh, there is no need for the Lyapunov function. So you do have, in fact, uh, uniformity in, in, the usual, in the usual sense. Um, so this theorem tells me something about the long term behavior of the Markov chain. And let me tell you why this theorem is important in order to understand mixing. So, um, so the first step to prove mixing for such uh, um, systems is to prove some sort of chaotic behavior. And uh, any uh, books on dynamical systems associate uh, uh, chaotic behavior with the existence of the positive Lyapunov exponent. So for random systems, this tells me something. So in general, the Lyapunov exponents tell me something about the exponential rate of a separation of two trajectories that starts very close to each other and uh, uh, separate uh, at rate, uh, say, e to the Number one, and the way it's defined is that you take uh, uh, the Jacobian of my composition of maps. I take the log, I divide by n, and I take n infinity. And this it can be uh, shown by uh, the Cauchy theory essentially that uh, this constant exists and uh, is uh, a deterministic uh, constant. So it doesn't depend on uh, the noise path, and it doesn't depend also on the point x. Okay. The problem is that uh, you don't know whether this constant is, is zero or is uh, positive. Okay, so uh, there is a classical criterion that uh, um, tells us whether uh, this is positive or not, and uh, is uh, usually known as Fustenberg criterion. That was originally stated in terms of uh, composition of uh, uh, matrices, or so random matrices, uh, but uh, um, in our case, it boils down to verify some linear algebra conditions. So I would like to take a, a couple of minutes explaining uh, what these uh, uh, conditions are. So um, essentially, I want to look at my dynamical system as for fixed x in the phase space as a function of my random uh, parameters, omega n, so on my finite sequence of parameters. And what I would like to find, I would like to find a an n and a set of parameters omega star and an initial point x star, such that the following happen. The Jacobian with respect to the random parameters of my map is subjective. And if I take now the Jacobian with respect to space and then a Jacobian, the Jacobian with respect to random parameters and I restrict it to the kernel of uh, uh, the Jacobian with respect to random parameter, then I have a, a surjective linear map onto the tangent space in uh, of uh, SLD, the special linear group in, in the dimensions. So if these two conditions are satisfied, then the Lyapunov um, uh, uh, exponent is positive. So let me tell you a little bit uh, how, uh, what uh, these two uh, conditions uh, imply and how uh, one would like to verify. I mean, in principle, it's just a lot of computations, right? Because uh, 
uh, you have to compute Jacobians and check uh, whether uh, certain matrices are full rank or not. Okay, but this gives a restriction also on on uh, how many um, iteration I have to look at, and uh, I, I'll explain this here. So in the case of the Pierre-Mer model, remember that I have that at each time step, I have a two vector of random parameters. So if I take the Jacobian of the, my map, which is a, 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 a two vector, right? And I take a Jacobian with respect to two n parameters, I get the two by two n matrix. And by condition one in this uh, uh, criterion, uh, this has to be surjective. So the kernel of this guy is 2n minus two dimension, okay? Um, okay, so um, now the second condition tells me that I have to restrict a certain matrix to this space that is 2n minus two dimensional and hopefully get a map that is onto this space, which is in our case, three dimensional. In the case of Pierenberg, because the special linear group is just uh, uh, the, the tangent space to, of SL2 is just the trace free matrices. So I have three dimensional space there. And so, in order to be able to map a 2n minus two dimensional space to a three dimensional space uh, subjectively, I need to have that 2n minus two has to be at least greater than or equal to three. Okay. So n is greater than five halves, so n is greater than three for us. So the problem with this uh, uh, approach is that uh, you have to compose your map at least three times, right? And then uh, uh, try to uh, check that those matrices are um, full rank. In, uh, if, you, if you were thinking of having an abstract dynamical system in which you inject an L vector uh, at each time, and you are in dimension D, then the condition, if you do the computation, is the following. So this condition tells you one thing, that uh, if you want to try to mix things or prove that something is chaotic in high dimension, you'll need to take more and more iteration of your map. So this becomes uh, costly computationally. And also, if you reduce the number of, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of randomness that you inject in the system. So if L is small, uh, well, you also have to increase N, okay? So condition two in general can be checked by computer if you like. Uh, you have to compute ranks uh, of matrices, uh, but uh, okay, we can do it by hand for here and there. So this is nice. And of course, uh, we cannot say much about uh, uh, any deterministic construction of the pyramid model in the sense that uh, uh, we cannot take uh, L to zero. So we cannot have no randomness in, uh, in, our, in our problem. Um, so, but uh, the first result uh, in our paper is that uh, the pyramid model in which I alternate uh, phases every time I share horizontally and then vertically as a positively optimized model. So these can be proven also if you don't change phase every half step of the time in the sense that you keep the same phase horizontally and vertically and then you change. This again becomes more costly because L is equal to one and so I will get uh, a bigger uh, N. So you have to check. Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, at least uh, n equal four. Uh, but uh, uh, it can be done. And it's uh, also true if instead you fix phases, say you fix the phases equal to zero, but you alternate uh, uh, at random times, okay? Essentially, the way you inject uh, uh, the uh, randomness in the problem doesn't really matter uh, for us as long as you inject some of it. And it's also not needed that uh, you take exactly the function sign, okay? So uh, in this sense, the, the, the framework is pretty robust, uh, but uh, what's completely open is that can you do this construction deterministically? So this, I don't know. Of course, at the end, you get a flow that has a positive Lyapunov of exponent. So you take a realization of our, uh, of our flow, of our velocity field, and that's, some velocity field, but I cannot write it down explicitly. Uh, 
Um, so, but uh, now, once you prove that you have chaos, let's say this is still not enough to prove mixing. And I want to just uh, give you a hint of uh, why this is not uh, true. So let me just first state uh, the result that we have, which is that uh, the pair model is mixing. And so you can prove uh, the decay of correlations in the way that I uh, showed you uh, before in a uniform way. So uh, the estimate here depends on the HS norm of uh, um, the functions phi and psi, the test function phi and psi. So this is effectively an H minus S exponential decay of uh, our uh, solution. Uh, if you want to go back to reading my first uh, slide. Um, however, to do this, you will need much more than just studying the one point process. So the, just the characteristics of the system. And let me just tell you uh, why you need this. So as I mentioned, you want to understand the decay of correlation. So this is the decay of correlation written in the discrete way. So you have these two test function phi and psi. And psi you compose with your flow map. And you integrate with respect to the Lebesgue measure in the case of uh, here and there. And you would like to understand uh, uh, wh whether this goes to zero or not as n goes to infinity. And so let's try to estimate the probability that this guy is big. So you just use Chebyshev inequality, and you can estimate this probability by uh, this uh, expectation. So the expectation of the square of, uh, of this quantity. So can you prove that uh, this goes to zero exponentially fast? Uh, well, what does this involve? At least uh, we can try to understand that. Well, if I just take a dummy variable y, I can split this product as a double integral with respect to the product measure pi cross pi um, of uh, uh, a test function that is a function of two variables and uh, something called the two-point process. So here I have two copies of the same process appearing here. And so I can think of, instead of studying the one-point process, which was just the characteristics, study the two-point process, which is uh, defined on the product space, okay? So nothing seems too hard uh, up to now. And this is that, okay, I'm substituting the one-point process with the two-point process. Um, and uh, I'm essentially rewriting everything in terms of a transition semigroup that uh, relates to this process rather than, uh, than the first one, okay? So, uh, however, why is this hard to study? Well, there is not really a, a good way to prove ergodicity for this uh, uh, process so directly because uh, there is clearly an invariant subspace for this problem. That is the diagonal. So if you, uh, the two point process should really be defined on the product space minus the diagonal. The diagonal is clearly invariant. So there is no way that you can prove that there exists a unique invariant measure on the whole uh, space, but you have to subtract the diagonal. And now here, the space becomes non compact. So I will have to use the abstract Aries theorem in its full force, uh, constructing a, a, a Lyapunov functional. So to understand the Lyapunov functional, uh, one would like to study some sort of linearization of this process. So instead of studying the two-point process, you can think of studying the uh, one-point process coupled with the distance uh, that uh, f of x minus f of y uh, given by the two-point process and linearize that. So if I linearize this process, I have uh, the one-point process and I have uh, the Jacobian process. So this is called the projective uh, process, which is simply the uh, one-point process coupled with um, not uh, the whole Jacobian, but just uh, uh, something that uh, tells me what is the direction of the dynamics ring. So, I take the Jacobian, I apply it to a vector, a unit vector, and I normalize it again. So this is the projected process. And this is useful to construct uh, the Lyapunov uh, uh, functional for the two-point process. So 
there are essentially three processes involved in the study of uh, exponential mixing, at least the way uh, we are going for this. And it's one point process, two point process, and projective uh, process. And out of all of these, you would like to prove that all of these uh, uh, processes have a unique environment measure by applying the Harris theorem. So the conditions that uh, you need to check are uh, reducibility, aperiodicity, minorization condition, and the Lyapunov function for the, uh, the uh, two point process. So the checklist uh, to prove exponential mixing for, um, for such a uh, uh, for such uh, systems is chaotic dynamics for the one point process. So top Lyapunov exponent has to be strictly positive and um, ergodicity for geometric ergodicity for three processes. If you can do that, well, if you can prove that you have exponential convergence to zero of this quantity, so the uh, two point process is uh, exponential ergodic, then you can prove that uh, the probability that the correlation is bigger, say that e to the n is small if this converges exponentially fast to zero, uh, um, sufficiently fast. So, um, so I will uh, skip this uh, in the interest of time, maybe, and in the last uh, few minutes, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, future uh, directions. So, of course, this is an abstract framework that can allow to construct smooth mixer in any dimension, in principle. Uh, what I showed you is that uh, this may become uh, very costly uh, with dimension. So, uh, all the uh, linear algebra conditions that you have to verify for aperiodicity, linearization conditions, and, uh, and so on, uh, become costly with dimension. So, in principle, it can be done, but uh, we just uh, restricted ourselves to uh, dimension two for the moment. Um, another interesting direction, I think, it's uh, to try to reduce uh, to a minimum the number of degrees of freedom in the sense of the number uh, of uh, um, random parameters that you take uh, in your problem. So. I mentioned to you that uh, uh, um, the chaotic behavior, so the existence of a positive Lyapunov exponent, can be proven for the Pierre and Bear model uh, if you don't alternate every half step the, the phase. But I don't know how to prove mixing uh, in, uh, in that setting. So for mixing, I really use uh, two different phases every time I alternate shears. Okay? And that's, uh, uh, that's hidden essentially. In the, in the proof of uh, irreducibility. Uh, you can try to prove uh, and other things about uh, this model. For example, if you add a little bit of uh, diffusion in the model, so proving uh, enhanced diffusion or enhanced dissipation uh, uh, in the case you have uh, diffusion in the, in, the, in the transport equation as well. And uh, the Paper of Pierre and Barry, in fact, is full of uh, interesting uh, results that uh, I uh, don't really know how to prove at the moment uh, regarding really scalar turbulence, if you, if you want, of this model. And let me mention that this can be done for the stochastic uh, Navier Stokes equation uh, problem that I mentioned before. And these are a series of paper of uh, Pedros and Blumenthal and Kushinsky. Um, what we don't address here is that it is uh, the existence of time periodic mixers in any dimension. So uh, our flows are definitely not uh, periodic. Um, at each time we change phases, so we don't know. Uh, they're definitely not periodic. They are only uniformly bounded in time. But uh, it is an interesting question to, to construct time periodic uh, mixers. Um, this may be also very hard. Uh, one way that one could approach this, but definitely far from being periodic, is uh, maybe change um, the phase. We, change, we take it uh, uniformly distributed in uh, 0 to 2 pi, and this is uh, OK. Uh, but uh, you can maybe try to take it in a discrete set. Uh, this would be pointing a little bit in the direction of uh, time periodicity, although we don't know how to do that. We haven't tried really uh, to do that, um, but um, I think it's an interesting uh, direction as well. 
Of course, uh, a much harder question is to quantify the mixing rate. So when uh, I apply the abstract uh, Harry's theorem, I get some rate of convergence. This rate is uh, uh, slower than uh, the Lyapunov uh, exponent, but I don't really know how to relate it uh, uh, to the mixing rate, the Lyapunov exponent and the mixing rate. So one way that uh, uh, one could try at least to gather some information about this is to make a small parameter appear. And possibly this small parameter could be coming from the uh, switching time. So uh, if you take a very small switch in time, can you, uh, can you quantify how the mixing rate and the Lyapunov exponents uh, uh, change? Uh, I think this is also a pretty hard uh, question. And in fact, but it shouldn't matter for, for mixing in the sense that uh, um, if you take uh, this random construction, any switch in time uh, will do. So we just fix it at the beginning uh, and we don't care for it. But um, if you take uh, just a, a fixed phase uh, flow, so say the phases uh, and you just alternate sine x and sine y, and it doesn't seem like uh, you have uh, mixing in, uh, in this case. So the switching time really requires uh, um, uh, some randomness uh, in it, uh, the, the switching time uh, quantification that um, Otherwise, uh, won't work uh, in a deterministic sense. So, okay. So, I think uh, I'm uh, pretty on time. So, I'll just stop here. And thank you for your attention.